Uh, welcome to the Orthodox Church of Arizona serving Coolidge in Florence. Um, this is the fourth Wednesday of Great and Holy Lent. Um, our speaker, our Lenten speaker tonight is Alexander uh, Reader, I'm sorry, Reader Alexander Liberio, a reader in the church, um, is a subclergy, and uh, if God will someday, um, uh, Alexander will serve as in the holy clergy. Tonight he is talking about Hermes, um, the Shepherd of Hermes, which is an ancient book, was not included in the canon, but it's an, it's still an important book for our uh, Orthodox Church. I'm reader Alexander. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for joining the talk. Uh, I'm going to begin here. So in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, brothers and sisters in Christ, tonight I'm here to talk about mainly two topics. We're talking about the topic of repentance, and we're also going to be talking about the, the um, topic of chastisement or holy suffering. And so <clears throat> I'm going to be using mainly the text, The Shepherd of Hermas, to be doing this. It's an ancient text, which, as Father said, um, was not included in the Bible, although it almost was included. There's one codex that finds it included. And St. Irenaeus of Lyon uh, thought that it should be included. Um, but I guess it would make the Bible probably too long because it's longer than probably two Gospels or even longer. So, And <clears throat> there are some moments where you could see the, the early church when they were figuring out exactly how to talk about the Trinity. Um, the Shepherd of Hermas is not super clear on that. Um, and so you could kind of see why it wasn't included. But in general, it's a very important text. And the themes of repentance and holy chastisement is definitely relevant for us, not just during Lent, but all the time. And so... This is one of the few texts that is not, um, because it's so early, it is not addressed primarily to monastics. Monastic, formal monastic communities didn't exist yet. And so it's actually addressed to mainly married people, but anyone in the, in the world, but especially families. And so <clears throat> as a quick little introduction to get into this, why was this text written? Well, there was a theme, a very ancient theme going back all the way to Moses, and it talks about the way of life and the way of death. And so we have an image of this in the first Psalm, which opens up the, all the wisdom literature to us. It begins, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the ungodly are like the chaff which the wind drives away and shall perish. And it actually stems from an even older tradition um, when Moses in Deuteronomy, he says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live. And lastly, most famously, it's probably well known from the, the um, text called um, the Didache, which was an ancient catechism. It's the first formal catechism that exists. And it's even older than the than the Shepherd of Hermas. And it starts off, there are two ways, one of life and one of death, but great difference between the two ways. And so there has been this ancient theme going all the way back to Moses about there's two ways to the kingdom, a way of life and a way of death. And now what the Shepherd of Hermas offers us is a really is, is a really innovative kind of third path, I'm going to call it. Um, I don't mean that in a way to suggest there's an additional path of some kind that there's this gray area that you can exist in. That's not what I mean. What I mean is it describes to us a kind of pathway of those who are in the world undergoing tribulations and hardships and sufferings and trying to do good, but failing or doing bad and repenting. And so it really offers us an image of how can you 
change the path that you're on? How can you go from the path of death to the path of life or vice versa? Which was, from my knowledge, the first time this was brought up. And so I kind of think of it as kind of a, a third path. And the way you do that, here's a spoiler, spoiler alert. We're going to be talking about this the whole time, is repentance. But not just any repentance. A repentance of the full heart without double-mindedness, meaning you go back and forth. And this word double-mindedness must appear over a hundred times in this text. It's constantly being brought up. And yeah, so we're going to get into that. So the shepherd of Hermes is the name of the text. The, the main character is Hermes. And the shepherd is one of the angels who gives him the revelation. So the genre is, uh, is an apocalypse. It's a revelation. Oh, it's, a story. It's, a, it's a story, exactly. So it's, it's an inspired account by Hermes, who some people say were the, um, was the one of the 70, Hermes. Um, it could be him. It could also be another Hermes from the second century. The point is it's very old text from not later than mid second century. And it just recounts his visions that he's given. And so there are five visions. I'm going to go through them and focus mostly on one, but I'm going to go through all of them. Um, and the last vision contains commandments and parables. And so I'm going to be going through this and just really giving um, it, giving us kind of stopping and seeing how we can glean information from this uh, for our spiritual lives. And so repentance is what brings us on to the other path, but this takes the form of chastisement or a purgation or a purification. There are different words that are used. And so this life is a, a, is a purging so that we can fit into the he heavenly kingdom. And so let's begin. We're, we're going to go um, into the visions. There's five visions. Um, I'm going to go real quick on some of them because uh, they're not as relevant. And also uh, the text is really long. And so some of these go on for chapters and chapters. So unfortunately, we don't have the time. Um, so the first vision, Hermes explains who he is. He says that he used to be a slave and that the, the Christian woman bought him. And then the Christian woman set him free because she was she was very righteous and she simply set him free. He went on and, and got married and had children. And then he always loved her as a sister. But then he says, so the perspective is from Hermes. This whole, this whole uh, dialogue is from the perspective of Hermes. And he says, however, once he saw her bathing and he didn't have a lustful thought, but he, he simply thought to himself, Oh, how nice it would be to have this person as a wife. And keep in mind, he was already married and had children at the time. And so afterwards, he sees a vision. Um, an, uh, the woman comes to him in a vision. So all of a sudden, he's like knocked on the ground and he sees this woman. And she says, why, why, why did you sin against me? Why, why are you doing this? You're a righteous man. Um, and he tries to avoid the... the uh, the conversation saying, oh, it wasn't, I didn't lust or anything. I was just, you know, and she said, no, even a small sin is a lot for a righteous man. And so it, that begins to show you how we're all judged on, on different levels. Hermes was very, very righteous, but even this, this momentary thought was enough to have him condemned. And then he's revealed, uh, the angel reveals to him, although this is a great sin, God is even more angry for you more angry at you for the fact that your household sins and because you are the head of the household, it's your fault and you don't admonish your children and you don't try and keep your wife holy. And therefore God is angry with you because they repented. And so he's kind of taken aback and dumbfounded and that's the end of the first vision. The second vision continues. This happens a year later. Hermes has a second vision. And then there's an old woman that comes. And the old woman says, um, asks him to transcribe a book. That he says, this is a book for the elect. Can you transcribe it? It's written in an angelic language that he can't understand. The moment he's done, she takes the book away from him. 
And so he really wants to know the meaning of this. So he fasts for 15 days and he prays and fasts. And then the meaning is revealed. The angel comes to him, this old lady. Now it's a different angel. And so, uh, or, sorry, originally it wasn't an angel. It was the woman. And now it's an, a very old woman. And she says, God is specifically angry at you because your children blasphemed the Lord, which the context makes it seem like they apostatized. And the wife's sin is that she can't control her tongue. And you don't admonish your, your wife and you don't admonish your children. And you are a simple man who has self-control and you can be saved. He, she gives him a lot of uh, uh, hope by saying, if you remain steadfast in your self-control, you can, you can be saved. Um, and then she goes on to talk about the great tribulation that's coming. And she doesn't really get much more into it. And so he's kind of confused. And he's praying for uh, discernment and understanding because these angels are not. Anytime he asks anything about, could you please, please explain this to me? He gets chastised for it. They rebuke him constantly in this. So they really, he's a righteous man. But because of these two sins, he's constantly chastising this entire thing. And you'll see this is a, this is a theme that comes up throughout. And so he's told that, oh yeah, he's told that the tribulation, the reason is so that it can purge the uh, ungodly from the church to keep them out of the church. And also so it can purify the elect so that they have a place within the church. And very soon we're going to get an image of what that means. Now the third vision, she comes again. And each vision when she comes, she also came in the first vision, by the way, I, I skipped over it. But she came in the first vision. She was very old. In the second vision, she had like, um, she was old, like old gray hair and wrinkles and stuff. But otherwise, she was very youthful. In the third vision, her wrinkles went away, but she only had old, ha old hair. So she's getting progressively younger. And she was she was brought in with uh, on this ivory seat, kind of a couch, with held by these these men that were bringing her in. And now he sees for the first time. This is the major image that we see in the Shepherd of Hermas. We see the image of a mighty tower being being uh, being made out of these square stones, and it's built upon a um, a, a big white block, a white. Uh, rock with a gate in it so it's hewn into one object with a big gate he sees people who are going to get rocks from different mountains some have defects some are perfect and some are just cast away and unused um at this point they try and end the vision but he presses her saying what's going on this is so confusing to me please explain what's going on and so she reveals that the tower, she is the church as an old, she's old because the church is very old, but she's getting progressively younger because Hermes is in, in these visions, he's gaining spiritual, um, he's advancing spiritually and he's starting to repent with his full heart. And so the church appears young to him because it brings youth back, back to the church should bring youth back to those. Who are who are spiritually advancing and so um, he she also says that the tower is also the church and the rock is Jesus Christ and the gate is also Jesus Christ and these angels or these men bringing the stones are the are the angels that are bringing the stones and the stones are individual Christians and some of them it goes through all different classifications some of them are different colors because they come from different there's 12 mountains, and each mountain is a different color, and it represents the 12 tribes or all the different uh, the nations on the earth. And they look different when they're coming in, but when they go, when they when they when they're brought into the church, they fit perfectly together and they become the same color. And so some are chipped, some are cracked, some are moldy, some are black, and the ones that turn black, they're rejected. Um I'm going to get more into this later because it's this is brought up. Uh, this is the main thing we're going to talk about. I just want to send it up, uh, set it up. The last thing I want to say on this is that um, I guess the pivotal message of this this uh, third vision would be that 
the ones that are thrown away, some of them are completely smashed away, thrown in the in the fire. And those are unusable for the tower. But some of them are just thrown like far away, far away, some not so far away. And some are just left there to see what happens, I guess. They're going to fix them later, try and fix the cracks and stuff. And so Hermes thinks that the end of the world has come because he sees this church. And she says, no, look, this church is still being built. There's still additions to be made on this on this on this tower, and so the tower is still being built. Um, we still have time to join, but the but it's coming very quickly. So the fourth vision um, is very quick. Hermes just sees a big whale-like beast, and 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 he's he's um, very large, and he has like fiery locusts coming out of his mouth, and there's four colors on his head. Um, However, Hermes, because he's been so spiritually advanced at this point, he puts he just puts all his trust in the Lord and he's completely saved. He's not harmed at all. Um, beyond that beast, he meets the woman. And this time the woman is completely young. She's not old at all. And she's dressed in white. And she says that the beast is a type of the tribulation to come. And the four colors on his head, they represent the four ages of the world. So the first is black, which is the current darkness. <clears throat> The second is red, which is the perishing of the world by blood and by fire, which will happen at the end, almost at the end. The gold is what remains after. So it's purified, period, in between the end and the destruction. It's very kind of, um, it seems like a very uh, uh, short period. Um, that's a, kind of a transition period. And then the white colors the purity of eternal life and so now we get into the fifth vision and the woman the old now young woman who represents the church she gives um an, a, an angel is given to another angel is given for this fifth and last vision and this vision is a shepherd and this is where the name comes from shepherd of hermas he's a shepherd and he, is, he reveals later on that he's actually the angel of repentance that was assigned when God ordained repentance to exist. And so now we're starting to get into the theme of repentance. Repentance didn't always exist. Um, we're told in this text that God, when man first sinned, God had to, um, like I, I guess like he did when he, joined a, a holy council of his of his three persons when he decided to to create the world he also decided to counsel and discuss whether they sh he should allow repentance or not and so we see re re from the beginning that repentance is a mercy of god he didn't have to get grant us the possible possibility of repentance he could have just damned us right away for what we did and not allowed us to repent but out of his mercy and his compassion he allowed it. And so this, um, because of now Hermes has, has, has come to a really high level of spiritual advancement, this angel of repentance is now assigned to him for the rest of his life. And he gives this last vision. And this last vision exists in two parts. The first part is a list of mandates that he says, if you follow these mandates, this is the, this is the way of life. So it's 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 uh, similar to um, the Didache or the or the Psalms or what Moses said, but then he gives ten parables to show how to attain that. And so this is for the rest of the talk what I'm going to focus on. And so the twelve mandates I'm going to go through them very quickly because they're basically what we're told already uh, uh, the commandments of Christ and commandments of God, but they're kind of distilled down to twelve. Um, the first is have faith in God and fear Him and exercise self-control, put on righteousness. Um, only fear God, basically. The second one is don't slander, watch your tongue, because uh, you, can go, you can go to hell for it. It's, it's worse than you might think. Um, also part of that is giving to the needy in, a simplic in simplicity. I, I, I have to, unfortunately, go real quick over these. Um, some of these are multiple chapters long. It's just one commandment, but it's like four chapters long. And so I have to kind of skip over, but um, the language is very beautiful. These Im this imagery that's given, I highly recommend everyone to read it. Um, three is walk in truth always. 
for is thoughts of adultery and fornication as great sins. So this is more of a historical thing at the time. The church was wondering, um, can you repent after baptism? The shepherd of Hermas tells us, yes, you, yes, you can. But it's not profitable for you to repent too often because that means you're sinning often. And it's and if you're righteous, you should you shouldn't have to do that. So it's not saying don't repent when you sin. It's it's relating a time period where people were less fallen. This, this society was 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 stronger than it is now. It was still fallen, but it was stronger than it is now. Now we're even weaker as, as, as time goes on. And so at the time, it was actually possible that seemingly that people would not sin very often or if they would, they would um, uh, repent and not do it again. As Christ says, sin, go on and sin no more. Um but it was a big issue in the church, and they had to discuss this. And we even have uh, multiple groups of people who left the church because they thought, no, you shouldn't have to. Repentance is is uh, is a blasphemy. You, it's, you should just only need your baptism. And so number four, set, uh, it, this was linked. Uh, sorry, this was specific. This was most often linked to um, apostasy, idolatry, and adultery. And so this was given to make people um, to to talk about. The fact that you're, you you can you can repent after adultery, although it's a very bad sin. Um, five, it's really the fact that patience allows a, a space in you for the Holy Spirit to dwell, um, and this aids your work in righteousness. If you if you don't have patience, you can't allow the Spirit to enter your body, and make these works of righteousness um, possible. It's just too hard. You're doing everything on your own. Um, and that anger pollutes this. So if you if you have anger, it will kind of destroy this piece. So you have to destroy this anger in you and or get it out of you because this creates a home for the devil. And this image we'll see later. Um, I have a question. Yeah. The first Nicene thing was, was that 325? That was 325. So this is like 150 about. So this is way before. Let's repeat the question. So the question is, um, is that your question? Or? The, the first uh, Nicene council. So somebody asked about the first Nicene council. It was in 325. And the Shepherd of Hermes is dated at latest to 150. If it was one of the 70, Hermes, one of the 70, it would have been written even earlier at the end of the first century. And he references Pope of Rome, Clement Pope of Rome, and other people who show that it might have been early, it might have been late. There's different sources that contradict each other. And so, so the decisions of the church and how it should be run from his dream, who, who made the decision, the 70 before the, before the Nicene Council? For what, the Holy Spirit? Was it the, the 70 that decided... We're going to believe in this. We're going to believe in this. We're going to believe in this. Um, no, not really. Do you want to take it, Father, or do you want me to answer? No, we, the question was uh, who made up, I believe, paraphrasing, who made up the church and the rules of the church? Well, uh, Christ himself did. The people did not. We don't believe that a group of people sat down and said, here's everything you believe. There was some discord. The first council, the Apostles' Council, was in 63. And that's the <clears> first <throat> time, because when there, was, when there was arguing, so for the most part, everybody was universally on the same page. When there was division, then the councils would come together. But to understand the either the Apostles' Council or the Ecumenical Councils as simply people elbowing each other out of the way so that their view could be heard is wrong. That might be um, a Protestant way to look at things, but that's not how we understand it all. All of our councils, they had to be universally agreed upon or they wouldn't enact it. So we were never majority vote. So we didn't sit down here in a group and say, I want communion, I don't want communion, and now we're going to vote. It wasn't like that. So the 
um, the councils, we need to understand that our history and heritage comes from um, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, what Christ taught us, how the apostles lived, and not a group of us sitting down and deciding. Because we, we say we're a theanthropic organization or a theanthropic church, which means a God-man church. So what um, the discussion tonight, of course, is not directly on that topic, but Hermes um, is talking about um, issues that would make sense in that time and today. So that which he talks about is not strange to our ears as Orthodox. It is an important book. It was never part of the canon, the, the New Testament, but it was strongly relied on as um, like a foundational understanding. Okay, does that help? Yeah. Thank you, Father. Yes, absolutely. And if it did inform those at the first council, they would have read this. Like I mentioned earlier, one of the Bibles, one of the codex actually contained it in there. And we have saints like Irenaeus who, who considered it part of scripture. And so it was, it was held very highly. Um, oh, and somebody here on YouTube um, quoted Psalm 132 saying, behold, now what is so good or so joyous as for brethren to dwell together in unity. And so this is the spirit. The Holy Spirit brings us to act in unity. So thank you for that. It's very relevant. So I'll just go uh, go on real quick with the, the rest of them. Number, number six is um, walk straight the path of righteousness. And the fact that two angels dwell with every man, one of righteousness and one of iniquity. And so this image you have in like cartoons and stuff of a devil on one shoulder and like an angel, this is this is actually historic. OK, this kind of blew me away. I didn't know that. But this is there's a basis for this. Um, so you kind of have your guardian angel, but you already have you also have like your guardian demon that really hates you. Um, so we can't call him a guardian. Though. Uh, I don't know what you want. Yeah, a guard, not guardian's not right, but the uh, tormentor. Um, a tempter. So number seven, fear the Lord and don't fear the devil. He makes it very clear. No matter what the devil does, it doesn't matter. Um, he has been defeated. So only fear God. Number eight, the restraint of evil is righteous, but the restraint of good is a great sin. Oh, God, just, so this, God, yeah. Just, God, just. He's, he, he's, he's got something to say. So, <laughs> uh, um, no, you get it. So not, so this is really just condemning the lukewarm. It's not enough to not do good. Like the parable, the, uh, the, uh, the different parables about this, but. Um, the talents or like uh, the, I'm thinking of the Pharisee and the, the publican um, restraining good is a sin. So not doing evil is good, but you have to also do good. Um, nine is pray over all things with confidence. Um, faith is from God and the doubt is from the devil or doubting is from the devil. 10 is showing how bad of a, a, a sin grief is when it comes from doubt. So if you're doubting your faith and it gives you grief, he, they, the, the vision says, uh, the angel says to Hermes, this crushes the Holy Spirit. Um, however, if you have anger and you do something stupid and you have grief, then that kind of grief is good. But even better is just to get rid of anger and doubt and then you have no grief. <laughs> so that's uh, number 10. 11 is about false prophets, which, again, in the early church was kind of an issue. And the Didache goes into that a little bit, how to tell them apart. And basically, true prophets are meek and humble, and they only speak when God wants them to speak to bring people to repentance. False prophets are proud and talkative, and they only speak when they have something to gain or they want money. And he says, Do, would, the, would the Holy Spirit really need money? You know, so it brings up a lot of images of modern uh, heterodox individuals. I just leave it there. Um, and then number 12, the last one is cherish good and chase desires over wicked ones. Avoid covetousness, practice righteousness, virtue, truth, faith, meekness, etc. And so at the end of, of this receiving, so this is half the, the last vision. The last vision is really kind of long. Um, Hermes, he, 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 he's, he kind of questions, well, if this is so hard. How can we follow all these commandments? This is very difficult. Surely no one can do it. And then the angel gets extremely angry and he starts having like fire shooting out of his head and stuff. And he gets really angry and says, 
um, something which which I thought was just it was for me it was kind of a revelation because I was thinking that too. Yeah, it kind of sounds hard. He says, if you set it before yourself that they can be kept, then you can easily keep them. But if you think it's hard, if the thought of this being hard enters your heart even once, um, that they can't be kept by man because they're too hard, then you won't keep them. And the commandments that we just went through or the, the, the mandates they're called. And so he kind of, he kind of says, he kind of sh shows that it's a self fulfilling prophecy. You use it as an excuse to not do what you think you should. Um, and he says, just shun that thought and it'll be easy for you. Um, probably thinking about um, what I think about is when Christ says my, my yoke, is, my burden and yoke is, is easy. You know, my, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Something to that effect. Right. And then he says another very, very uh, relevant thing that I never thought about. He says, didn't God give mastery over everything? Didn't he give us dominion over everything? He says, yes. So if he gave us dominion over everything and mastery over everything, why can't we master these commandments? We should be able to master them. It should be in our nature to be able to do this. It should be easy. And so he says, he kind of condescends and explains why it's difficult for a lot of us. And he says, I'm, I'm quoting the angel here, the angel of repentance, who's the shepherd, right? He says, for those that have the Lord on their lips, but their heart is hardened um, and are far from the Lord, to them, these commandments are hard and inaccessible. So it comes down to us. It really condemns us. If we think it's hard, we should look at ourselves, really. It's not God's commandments that are hard. God, God's commandments are, um, are, 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 are blessings to us, to lead us to, to heaven. And this is brought, uh, imagery really nicely is brought up very later, uh, a little bit later. So now we're going to get into the 10 parables. And these two I'm going to have to go through pretty quickly because I really want to focus the rest of this talk on one specific parable, the ninth one because it's the longest and it's the most relevant. And all throughout these parables, the image of the tower being built in, uh, on this rock with the, with the stones and everything, this keeps getting brought up, and it, but it gets like deeper and deeper and they keep explaining the meaning. And so the ninth parable, it kind of explains everything. And so the first parable, he says, there's no purpose, there's a city, and all people do is gather possessions. I'm gonna I'm gonna say the parable and explain it at the same time. Forgive me, just because if I explain it and then go back, it's gonna take too much time. So basically, the city is the world that we live in, and he says if you just keep taking possessions, you'll get cast out because you're not obeying its laws, and this is death. The laws of this world is death, and so because we sinned, we were cast out of the garden, and we will eventually die because of our sin. Um, he says it's better to purchase property um, like that which is found in the, your native city, which is heaven. Um, do not covet, but do the work of God and you'll be saved. And so basically it sets this world up as a city um, and virtues and commandments are, are, uh, that are given following these is like buying property in another city, in a heavenly city. Um, whereas worldly affairs, and he says businesses, people have too many businesses. He says, um, you can have one business, but if you have more than one, you're just going to be worrying about that your whole life. Don't don't have more than one business. Just focus on one thing so that you can just make it make do in this world and just get through it. So I, I, I love this because, it's, again, it's really directed towards people in the world, married people. And um, a lot of this <coughs> advice is, is very practical. So the second uh, parable is of an elm tree that does not produce fruit because elm trees don't produce fruit and a vine. This might be one, uh, one of the more well-known uh, parables from here. Maybe some people have heard it before. Um, and he says they need each other. Though the elm seems not to produce fruit, it actually produces the most fruit. And Hermes is confused and says, what do you mean? It doesn't produce any fruit. He says the vine produces fruit but it needs to climb something. If it doesn't have anything to climb, it, it will still grow fruit, but not many. And because they're on the ground, they'll just rot. And so it actually produces bad fruit. <laughs> However, with the, with the elm, it climbs the elm. And then it produces fruit abundantly, and they're good fruit. And so he said the meaning of this 
is, and again, Hermes is like being chastised saying, I'm so ignorant. Can you please explain it to me? And he says, you should know this. Like we should just all know these parables. And he's chastising it for us, you know, for not, for needing this information. But um, he says the, as Christ does too, kind of with the apostles. But um, he, he says the elm is, the, is a rich man and, or those who have a lot of vanities in this world or a lot of attachments and the vine are the poor or those who don't have a lot of attachments and how we need each other. We're symbiotic because what happens is um, the rich have a lot of fruit that they can. Uh, so basically I think it's reversed. The, 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 the poor are the elm. They don't have anything. Forgive me that the poor are the elm. They don't have anything. The vine is the rich who produce fruit, but without the poor, they don't produce anything or their fruit is, is bad. That's because they don't have the intercessions of the poor to pray for them. And so he says, you really need each other so that with the poor, with the poor people, the, the, the poor who don't who seemingly don't produce fruit, um, with the rich man, they actually produce more fruit than the rich man. And the rich is able to provide for us, for the community and for the, the poor. Um, so they're really partners. And now that we're going to go through three and four, I'm going to do them together because they're really the same parable. I don't know why they split them up. But what they talk about is in winter, trees all look the same, whether they're green and they're alive in the summer or not, it's irrelevant. Dead trees and green trees or live trees, they both look identical in the winter and you can't tell the difference. But in the summer, the dead trees do not produce any fruit and they're dead and they're burnt down. And so he says, um, this life is like a winter where the righteous are working together with the, with, the, uh, with the unrighteous. And it's not till the summer, which is the life to come, where we will know and be able to discern the good from the bad, and only those who produce fruit will 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 live. Um, the fifth parable is about a slave, and so forgive me again. I'm going to explain it right away. I have to because of time. So the slave is a son of God, and he's put in charge of a field, which is the world. In this field, there's a vineyard, which are the people in the world. And he was told by his master, who's God the Father, or the Creator, um, God the Father, to stake it with a fence. Um, these fe this fence posts are the holy angels that kind of keep everything orderly and define the world in a certain way and execute God's will. And he says to only do this and do nothing else until he's away, and then he'll come back. <clears throat> But what happens is the fine yard, vineyard starts to get um, a lot of uh, uh, weeds. And so the, the, the slave decides to weed and to dig a little bit to make it look nice. And so when the master comes back, he is so uh, uh, surprised and, and, and pleased with the, with the uh, beauty that for the obedience, um, he, he frees the slave. And not only that, but makes him a co-heir um, with his son. And in this parable, the son is the Holy Spirit. So it's a little bit confusing, and maybe the parable breaks down a little bit. Um, and at another point, they also equate the son and the Holy Spirit, kind of. So I think they didn't really full, fully work out the Trinity by this point. So that could have been one of the reasons it wasn't accepted in Scripture. Um, but the master sends many dishes to the slave and says, Eat from my table. The slave eats, and then he gives the excess to his to the rest of the slaves. And so the rest of the slaves are us. The food is the commandments, which nourish us and they bring us, um, or they allow us to, to share in the table of the master, basically. Um, when, he, when the master saw everybody eating, he was also pleased that it was shared. Um, and then this, this uh, parable ends with Hermas, so, so this parable begins with Hermas fasting on a mountain and it ends with the angel rebuking him again for fasting like a hypocrite. 
And so this is, um, I was going to skip over it, but I think for Lent, it's, it's, it's relevant. Um, how to fast. He goes in and gives some very practical advice, how to fast. And he says, true fasting is, has nothing as I'm putting, I'm paraphrasing. I don't want to say nothing about to do with food, but he, he says, it's not really about food. Fasting is about avoiding sin, serving the Lord, keeping his commandments and walking all in, 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 the, in his ways, not mere abstention from food. So he's, he didn't say you, you can just ignore the food part of it, but it's not merely that. And again, it brings up the idea that uh, simply fasting without doing good um, is the fast of the Pharisees or the fast of the demons. Demons don't eat either. Okay. And so he gives very practical advice on how to fast properly. He's, Hermes says, how should I fast then? You know, just do good. But how? what should I do, for example? And he says, well, here's an example. Um, on days that you fast, you shouldn't need more than just bread and water. That should suffice for anyone in the world or not. Um, and he says, calculate how much you would have eaten that day. Um, and then give that money to the poor. So there's a very, very practical example of how you can do good. And I, there's so many other ways, but that's the example he gives. Now I'm going to do six and seven together. Um, Hermes has shown two other shepherds. One tends the sheep. And the sheep are flourishing, and they're they're so joyful they're skipping around. He says they're jumping. Okay, um, and then another shepherd has a whip, and he's cruel, and he ties them with thorns, and he whips them and tortures them constantly. Now this will this blew my mind. Okay, but um, you, 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 <clears throat> you might not expect this, but the first shepherd is the bad one. So the first shepherd is the angel of luxury and deceit who and who 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 um, entices people to just be gleeful in their life to avoid suffering of all kind and the jumping uh, the angel says uh, represents they're jumping away from the law of God they, they're so free that they can just do what they want and so they're frolicking in in a kind of frenzy um, and then he says the second is um, who's mercilessly torturing these sheep, he says, and the sheep are us, of course. He says, this is a holy angel of punishment that's given by God for a specific um, blessing. Okay, he uses these, this language to chastise us so that we can be purged after repentance and join in the tower. Okay, and so we're going we're gonna to bring this up really, uh, yeah. That's true. So the, so the question is, in that case, he wouldn't be cruel because he's doing it for their benefit, which is true. But it seems cruel. So Hermes doesn't know that. He's just seeing this. And like we all heard it. Like I mean, I could tell by everyone's face. They're like, whoa, same with me. Like, when you hear it um, or read it, you don't realize that. And so he says that um, this is a just angel of punishment. If, if you remember uh, on the past, on the, uh, uh, the original Passover, there's an angel of death, right? The angel of death comes from God. He went on and he went out and slaughtered people, right? So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a demon because he's doing things we think uh, he shouldn't do, you know. And so he explains the punishment is a simple, simply a temporal punishment. It's only punishment in this life. It's not um eternal and it's for instruction so that they can learn to walk in the ways of the lord and he also says it's not equal in duration and i'm going to skip over this pretty much uh, because it gets kind of convoluted but basically he says one year uh, one like unit of um of time of sin is treated with the same amount of punishment so one hour of Sin is given one hour of punishment. And then Hermes says, well, shouldn't don't we get like sevenfold our, our, our punishments for what we've sinned? And shouldn't we be chastised more? And he says, well, actually, that is a lot because he does a like a kind of angelic math. And he says that one hour of sin is met with by God, with this angel, with 30 
days of punishment is like 30 days of punishment. And so it is kind of confusing. What, what do you mean like it's 30 days of punishment? So that's why I'm not going to go deep into it. Just to say that one unit of sin, so let's say one day of sin, is God gives us one day of punishment. But this one day of punishment, because tortures are, it, 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 it scars us and it kind of it scars our memories, um, it's equal to much longer. So one, what you can think of it this way, like if you're doing a sin, um, sinning for an hour goes by quickly, but being tortured for an hour goes by very slowly. And so actually the punishments are already enough, worse, bad enough. That's, that's the point. And this is symbolic, so it's not necessarily to say it's a one-to-one -one ratio here, but the fact that we are, we are, there is like, there is this kind of like um, holy math going on where um, if you suffer your whole life, it could be because you sinned your whole life type of thing. So it also, this shows that there's consequences for sin. And that is, even though everything is, so he's very clear, yes, everything is, if you confess and you repent, Everything is forgiven, but there's still consequences. And this is also shown in the in the in the in the in the in the blocks. The blocks are chipped, and the angels go out to fix some of them, the, the stones that are used for the tower. But even after he fixes them, there's little marks on them where the chips used to be. And so it's to show that there's still consequences for your sin. Um and then he's told that he will be punished by the specific angel for the sins of his household. Because he was the head of the household and he didn't keep them pure. Um, this reminds me of Father Earl saying when uh, in, in the old days, you know, um, your family would say, act properly because you represent this family. Well, that's, I mean, there you go. So you can see where that comes from. It, it is true. And if your children sin and you're righteous like Hermes was, it's still your fault, right? Um And he also says the reason he's giving this torment to Hermes is because he's so spiritually advanced, he's now worthy of proper instruction through this suffering. And so he doesn't give this to all of us. If, if, if It's a holy blessing. And so if you have these, these sufferings in your life or illnesses or hardships of any kind, you really should count yourself blessed. I think, was it St. Porphyrios who prayed for cancer, right? Or, or yeah, right? Paisos. Was it Paisios or Porphyrios? Paisios. So... Yeah. Did, does he talk about your attitude during the suffering and how that affects whether you gained a spiritual blessing from it? Whereas, you know, say you yes, stand, yes, he does. Yes. The so the question is, does he talk about the attitude while you're being punished? And I was trying to think, and yes, he does. Um, they basically imply you have to not complain and you have to see it as. Um, see and see yourself for deserving it. Bring up, you're causing this. God does not do this for any other reason, because then He loves you. It says, I think in Corinthians, that chastisement is from the love of God. Okay. Um, okay. Um, Saint Paisius, so I was corrected on there. Thank you. Um, So yes, we, we have to bear all punishments in life, like illnesses, et cetera, um, see it as a blessing, not complain and blame. Otherwise, we do lose the blessing. Yeah, um, It's kind of a short way of saying that he basically implies that. So now eight. So we're going to do eight and nine. The tenth one is not really a parable. So um, 50, we have to, we have an hour, right? Ten more minutes. So. Number eight, Hermas shows the people of God standing under a willow tree and the branches are being pruned by an angel who cuts off the branches, but the, the branches just regenerate. It's as if nothing has been cut off. And then he gives it to people and then people go off and they come back with their branches. He asks for them back and there's all different kinds of branches. Some are dried up and kind of like rotted. And some are in really good condition. Um, like they're green and some are budding and there's fruits coming out. And so to those who brought back those with fruit, they're crowned. 
those who have green branches, they're clothed in white and allowed to enter into the tower. Um, those who are um, remaining, the withered ones, he says, plant them and we'll see if they grow. So they plant them in the earth to give people a chance. And then again, some of them grow, they're inspected. Um, some are let into the tower and some aren't. He says the tree is revealed to be the law, which is the son of God, the logos. <clears throat> the angel doing the, the sorting and cutting and giving is the archangel Michael, who has been placed in charge of God's people. Um, and those who are allowed to enter are those who specifically have suffered or been afflicted, like we talked earlier, um, or, or, or had at least remained pure in their hearts. And so now we'll go on to number nine. Uh, number nine is the main uh, parable. Um, there are 12 mountains, like I explained before, and so I'm not going to go into it again, but they, they go into more depth with everything. And the gate is now guarded by 12 virgins, and there are men who are bringing in these rocks. These virgins are described... Um, well, they're give, their names are given, and they are basically vir different virtues. And there's four of them that are more magnificent than the other. Um, the, he names them. They're faith, continence, power, and long-suffering. And power means the power of God or the, vir the power for virtue. Um, and the rest are simplicity, innocence, purity, cheerfulness, truth, understanding, harmony, and love. And so why are these other virtues higher? It's, you know, it says in the scriptures that the love, love is the highest, but this is specifically in reference to allowing us, bringing us into the church, what we need to, in our specific situations, to go from that path of death to life. So again, this is all the meaning for all of this. It's how do we translate to another path? Yes, we need all of them, but specifically, faith, continence, power, and long-suffering through this, the torments, as we're talking about, is what's needed for the purification. Um, the stones, that be, uh, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the men bringing them in are angels, but then even after they bring these stones in, now they, they're, we're told that these stones are actually men, they're actually us. Some of them desire to go with another group of women who appear and they're black and they're very attractive and they have long flowing hair. They're not uh, covered. Their hair isn't covered like the virgins. And so these are like kind of the ant, these are the vices that men, even after entering the gate, have decided to change their mind and go back. And this is the, this is, this is the, uh, the double mindedness of, of, uh, that happens when we repent and then we go back to our old way of life because remember again at the beginning it was very it, it, they were very strict if you read canons there were long penances for for, um, for uh, sins and there were different classes of sinners there were sinners lamenters who who who, who uh, stayed outside the church and asked people to pray for them they weren't even allowed in the church and then there was another class that was allowed in but they had to leave with the catechumens and there was another class who had to stay the entire service on their knees. They were the penitent, the penitents called like the prostrators or whatever. And then there were the redeemed ones who were able to stay with the rest of the church through the whole service, but they weren't allowed to commune. So now basically we have all those. That's the only office we have left. Um, I don't, I never really heard of someone not allowing going to church for a sin um, anymore. And so, this is trying to show you how how damaging to the soul sin is for you, especially that we already have the, the fullness of the faith. We already have the truth. There's no reason for us to go back. And he even says that there's a time where you, where the tower will be built and you can't repent anymore. There's no time to repent because it's already and you have been repaired. So the chips that exist in you, chip yourself again. And when we're put in, to these rocks together we fit together and then we fit perfectly together we came from these different mountains with different <clears throat> colors and this represents he says it represents the different uh 
the different uh, customs and things that exist with different people. But we, we, we become clothed with the, the garments of the virtues, the virgins who are bringing us in. And we can only go in with those, with those virgins. Uh, some rocks were tried to brought, the angels tried to bring in rocks on their own and it, it didn't go through the gates. They weren't allowed through the gates. And so um, these vices, they take the rocks and they throw them back. And like I said, some are thrown close to the tower and they can be reused. Some are further, according to their sin. They give the classification of what sin gets you thrown, how far. And then some are just thrown away, shattered into pieces and not used. So there are some people that just can't be, that will not be saved. It's not that they can't be saved. They will not choose to be saved, which fights another heresy that came on later of universal salvation. And so... Um, that is pretty much the majority of what I want to say on there. I had to kind of cut it short um, for time. But the point is, the, the point that everyone should um, come away with is that, um, oh, and I'll just real quick to end it, the 10th parable, he's, he's given the virgins to stay with him forever in his household and he says don't ever sin again because then you're gonna you're gonna bring other spirits into your household and so if you see um if you see you know households either others or in yourself not judging others but some households are completely chaotic and there's always strife and fighting in there he says the reason is because you're doing a sin when you're not in the house and you've opened the door to that specific demon versus the virtues which should always stay with you and so this really lays out i think the path to life not just saying what are the what are the commandments but how do we get there through repentance which is of a whole heart and not double-minded which double-mindedness is seen is 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 um is portrayed in this text as the antithesis to repentance as the complete antithesis, if you don't make spiritual progress and just every single week com confess the same thing, it's not repentance. But if you do in some way, and this is where only the spiritual father has the discernment to see this, if there is a little bit of a struggle, this is where our salvation comes. And in doing this, it makes us stronger and it makes us more worthy of, 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 a, of, a, of a purging of a of a chastising which cuts the stone away there are there are, there are uh, rich round stones rich men who are round stones and they have to cut a lot because they're round you know giving away their possessions and their vanities and unless we're cut in this way we won't fit together perfectly interlocked hermes couldn't even see the lines in between um and so may god bless us to um to accomplish this um, let us pray for each other and let us pray to the glory of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, now and ever and at the ages of ages. Amen. Um, Alexander, if, um, you, why don't you uh, take a couple of questions, either from people that are chatting or from the people here? Okay, so I'll just do a couple here because there's this person that is asking questions. Could you define double mindedness according to the Orthodox understanding? I hope I just defined it. Did, did I, or should I go deeper? So double-mindedness is simply um, speaking one thing with your lips, but your heart is elsewhere. So your will is one place, but your heart is somewhere else. And so it's seen as um, 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 it, it, it's displayed in, in, in the world by constantly doing the same thing even though you claim to repent or you tell your spiritual father, I repent. And it's, it's really, you need to use a lot of discernment with this because there are images we have of uh, holy monks who are every single night fighting with each other, but then they are, you know, there's a vision and the mother of God comes and says, no, they're actually holy because they are truly repenting. They are repenting. And so this is not for us to judge. It's not for us to use this to judge others. But if you ever find yourself, it's better to look at yourself. If you ever find yourself in confession, for example, and just every week, same exact thing. Um, I got angry at my husband or wife, or I, um, 
I, uh, I got in a fight with my husband and wife and, and simply, you, you don't feel that you've actually repented. Repentance is change back to Christ. It's not just, it's not just, I feel bad about something. It's a true change that requires you to stop what you're doing, redirect, and then start doing something else in accordance with God's commandments. If you don't do that, that is not repentance. That is double-mindedness. Um, another way to, and that's, a, of course, correct. But another way to look at double-mindedness, I think, is what Thomas had asked earlier about looking at intent. And, um, you know, God loves a cheerful giver. So it's not just giving, but it's your intent is love, loving, cheerful. It's the same thing with everything. If I'm being, um, the, the sacrifices under the Jewish temple was that the owner uh, of what was being sacrificed, the animal being sacrificed, had to do it um, in joy and love and, and willingly, not because someone was forcing him. So that double-mindedness could also be thought of as there's a struggle between you, your intent, and your actions. And so even though the actions may be correct, that you're you're fighting with yourself. So it's another way to look at it. That's a yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. And again, I rec highly recommend everyone to read it. And there's there's a um, audio book which is really really good because it's set up like a play, and Her Hermes is like. It's like a uh, an actor who's reading it, and and then the the, the women are all different actors, and so it, it's 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 much easier to understand, and it's very beautiful the imagery, and a lot of these things um, I read this a few years ago, and it always stuck with me. Just thinking about, let's say you're outside and you want to, you're doing, you think about committing a sin, and you I th I think of which do I want holy virgin angels in my house, or do I want demons in my house? basically, you know, and a lot of these imagery, it is so many, I skipped over so much of it. Like there's a lot more depth. And so I really just urge everyone to go read it. Um, it's, it's one of my favorites. So are there any other questions or comments or anything? Well, thank you, um, reader. And may God bless you. May God bless all of us. Um, as we're just a little bit farther than halfway through Lent now, we're, we're closer to the light of Pascha than when we started, and may the, the difficulties and tribulations that come during Lent be for the glorification of God and for our salvation. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Father. Bless. Uh, thank you all for, for coming, and God bless you this evening, and again, have a blessed, wonderful Lent.